Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Miss Flips. In today's episode, we are going to be flipping this bad boy into something less, um, more, um, more. Anyways, let's get flipping. I honestly don't know what this piece did to deserve this, but it has gotten beat up in its lifetime. As you can see, someone tried to make some repairs by screwing it into the surface of the drawer. Uh, but yeah, it has like markers on it and what I think is white out, some heart-shaped little glitter sticker things, scratches, dents, little like veneer damage, one of the metal pieces is coming off, the drawer is coming apart. It has got a lot of work that needs to be done, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys my step-by-step -step process on how to prepare a piece for painting. So right now what I am doing is I'm cleaning the piece and the reason why we clean pieces before we sand or paint is because we want to get all of the potential grime that's on the piece left over from past owners or because it was left in storage, whatever the case may be. We just want to get it all cleaned off before we sand because when you go into sand, if there is any grease or anything on the piece, it is going to be embedded into the wood and can either come through your paint or leave like splotches on the wood and it's just not a good look. So when you are cleaning the piece, you can choose a variety of products. I personally choose to use vinegar and water. I do a half and half solution and just put it in this reusable spray bottle. And the reason I use water and vinegar is because it is also environmentally friendly as well as working extremely well with different greases and grime and all the dirt that's on the piece. While other products will work just fine, I prefer to use this one because it is so eco-friendly and sustainable. And once your piece is all clean, this is the time that you take to look your piece over and see if there are any repairs that need to be made either to the surface of the piece or foundationally, like in this case, a screw that's screwed into the surface that was holding in a uh, drawer slide. And so I'll need to be repairing that drawer slide later as well. And repairs like this can be made with different materials. I'm personally using wood filler because that is what I had on hand, but for big dents and scratches like this, you can use things like Bondo or even Spackle and just whatever works for you, whatever you like working with. And so for this missing bit, it is a pretty big chunk missing. So I'm letting the wood filler dry in between coats and then kind of layering it on, building it up so that I can sand it down to the shape that I want it to be, this corner edge right here. And when I'm doing repairs like this, I personally like to make sure that whatever I'm using to fill the hole is raised higher than the wood itself. That way when I go in there to sand, I know that I'm not sanding any deeper than I need to go and I can get it nice and flush with the rest of the wood. For the metal decals that are on the corner of the pieces, I opted to get rid of them just because I'm not really a big fan of metal decals on pieces like this anyways. So I used my uh, way too flexible putty knife to get them off, but hey, you know, it, it did the trick. And now on to addressing this problem. It's, it's beautiful. What can I say? People were making do with what they had, you know? And uh, they, you know, they made it work. We're just gonna, you know, make it work better and look whole and functional. So I started by removing all of the bits and pieces, all the screws, all the wood, everything. I started by gluing this little guy together first before gluing him on to his uh, dad or, you know, larger half. And then I went ahead and did a cheeky little dry fit to make sure that I was putting it on the right way. 
before I got to gluing and then I put glue on both sides this side and then on this smaller side right here and spread it around that way it got on all the little pieces of wood and into each little crevice in there as much as possible before I put it in place and then clamped it down so that it could dry properly <laughs> Jeez, did you hear that vocal fry? A dry properly. Blah. When applying wood glue into holes like this, I like to make sure that I put plenty on there, making sure that it goes down into the hole itself. As you can see, I'm smearing it around kind of right now, but right here I'm applying pressure, making sure that the wood filler goes down into the hole. That way the hole is completely filled up and the wood filler doesn't have an opportunity to dry further into the hole. Because when that happens, then your wood filler ends up kind of sinking in and you end up with this like tiny micro hole that is lower than the rest of the woods surface. And when it comes to big scratches like this, I tend to like to put wood filler in it. Um, you don't really have to, you can kind of just see if your sander gets rid of it on its own, but I like to just put a little bit of wood filler in these guys. And the easiest way to do that is just to see if the scratch has any like raised side that is higher than the other. This one, the bottom side of the scratch was raised higher, so I went against that and kind of just pushed the wood filler into the uh, scratch that way, making sure that it was just nice and filled and solid all the way into the scratch. This will just make sure that your scratch will come out even with the rest of the wood grain once you're sanding it off and getting ready to paint. And moving on to bigger problems like this drawer here. As you can see, the dovetails are coming undoved. So I just went ahead and completely lifted it out of the um, joints and then went in there with my syringe and got glue in all of the little joints here, making sure to stick the needle part of the syringe down in there and getting a nice amount of glue and I am using a Gorilla wood glue. I really like this glue. It dries really fast and I have never ever had a problem with it coming apart. So I highly recommend it. And then a quick little tap with my little rubber mallet here. Trust me, I'm doing it a lot more gently than it sounds, um, but yeah. And then once all the joints are in place, I'm gonna go in there and clamp it down both the like on the top like this and then on the sides like this And did you guys know that these little guys right here are completely reusable? You just have to clean off anything that's on the outside and then put on this rubber cap. And this rubber cap is kind of difficult to get on, but that means you got a good seal and nothing inside it will dry up or stick together. And that way it is perfectly fine to use over and over again and doesn't end up in the trash. And then once your glue is dry and all your repairs are made and your uh, wood filler is dried up, you can go ahead and start sanding. And the way that you sand kind of depends on what you plan to do with the piece. As you see here, I'm kind of just gliding over the finish here and scuffing it up, but then I decided to start going really slow with my sanding and taking my time because I realized that the wood grain underneath this finish was actually really nice and so I decided to bring it down to bare wood that way I could keep it natural and then only paint parts of it. So as you can see, I'm going very, very slow here and putting minimal pressure, and this will minimize the amount of little squiggly guys that you are left on your wood 
um, the more you press down on the sander and the faster you go, the more of those little squiggly guys you'll end up getting. And so I'm just taking my time, not putting that much pressure on it and going really slow, making sure to get all of that finish up. And so this method is used when you are going to either stain or, you know, bleach it or, you know, you just want the, the wood, the natural wood finish. Um, of course, if you're going to paint, you don't need to strip it down all the way to the natural wood. You can do what we call a scuff sand, which I'll show you in a little bit. But um, yeah, so I'm just taking off all of the original finish and getting these drawers nice and bare and prepared for what I'm going to do with them. This angle is perfect for showing the sheen that's on the top of the dresser right here. You can see the reflection in it. And this is a product of fake wood or laminate and it's not real wood. If you sand through it, you'll be sanding down to just nothing special. So what I'm doing here is I'm scuff sanding the entire top because I'm gonna be painting the entire top of it. So with the scuff sand, what we're trying to do is give the paint something to adhere to. So giving it a nice rough scuff sand over will give the paint something to stick to rather than trying to grip onto the slick surface. So you can do this pretty much with, with any grit. I haven't experienced any difference between grits as far as uh, adhesion goes, um, but right now I am using a 60 grit sandpaper to go over this and get through all of that slick surface and make sure that all of the shine is gone off of the top. Traditionally, when you sand, you do want to start with your lowest sandpaper. So you're going to start with like either an 80 grit or a 60 grit, and then you're going to progressively move up to a 120 or a 180 or, you know, finish at a, at a 220 grit. So you're going to end on your highest grit. Start at the lowest, end at the highest. And the reason why we do this is because sometimes with a lower grit sandpaper, even though you are moving as slowly as possible, and even though you know, you're not putting too much pressure onto the sander itself, it still leaves behind some of those little squiggly guys and ends up with a really rough finish. So we move progressively through the sandpaper just to make sure that we're getting the smoothest finish possible and to make sure that all those little squiggly guys left by the grit below are completely gone, which is easy to do when you move up gradually like that. So 60 grit, we'll leave a lot of squiggly guys. 120 or 180 grit, we'll get rid of the squiggly guys left by the 60 grit and then leave their own squiggly guys that we'll get out by using the 220 grit. And the 220 grit will really not even leave any squiggly guys, uh, at least that are noticeable. And they won't come through in your finish. They'll just come out really nice and smooth and your wood will be nice and soft after finishing the with a 220 grit. For this piece, I decided to go with a two-toned look. And if you aren't doing a two-toned look, if you are just gonna be painting the whole piece, as I said before, you don't have to get it down to natural wood, but I am getting down the pieces that I am gonna be leaving natural wood down to the natural wood. Um, and then I am just giving a, a once over with my 120 grit sandpaper on the parts that I am going to be painting. And yeah, so like I said, if you're if you're just going to be painting the whole thing, this isn't too much of a worry for you. You're just going to go over the whole thing with a uh, 120 grit or 220 grit, just making sure that you give the paint something to grip to. And just a little tip, if you are looking to do some sanding, I highly recommend using the reusable sandpaper. 
They are washable, so if you give them a rinse out in like the sink or whatever, they are reusable, so you can reuse them uh, several times. And I find that they last a lot longer than regular sandpaper. And also, they they help the environment, you know? So I would consider getting those. They are a little bit more expensive, but like I said, they do last a lot longer, so I would highly recommend it if you're looking to make some more eco-friendly adjustments. At this point in the process, I was still a little unsure on what I was going to be doing with this piece, so I decided to go ahead and sand down the sides of the pieces down to natural wood. That way, if I did decide to leave them natural wood, I had the option to do so and didn't have to go back and sand later. I recommend doing this because you never know when you're going to want something to be natural wood, so you might as well just strip it down to the bare wood just in case you end up wanting to do it later. Later, and it saves you time and energy. So for these little stubborn corners here, I unfortunately don't have a corner sander that is any good, so I have to go in there and hand sand it. And I'm using an old gift card as well as a piece of sandpaper, and I'm just putting the card right into the sandpaper and just wedging it into the corners, just making sure to get up all of that old finish there that I can with my hand. But if you have a corner sander or a surf prep sander, now would be the time to use it to get in those little stubborn corners that your regular sander can't reach. And once your piece is completely sanded and you are ready to start your painting process, you are going to go ahead and vacuum off all of the bits and pieces and make sure to vacuum really well, getting the inside and all the surfaces with a brush extension and making sure that all the dust is off before you start painting. For my piece, I do have a lot of natural wood that I want to keep natural, so I am going to be taping over the surfaces that I don't want to be painted before I paint. And so I'm lining each surface, and as you can see here, I'm going right across this straight line, and if I bend either side of the tape like this, you can see how the edge of the tape goes past the top of the piece, and so you want to be conscious of how you're holding your tape, because tape does bend, and depending on how you hold it, it can bend past wherever you want it to be taped, and I want it to be right flush along this edge. So go little by little, making sure to pull it past or below the edge as you press it down, and this will help get that flush straight line exactly where you want it to be. I think this might be a little bit better of an angle to see exactly how I do that. So I start off on one corner, making sure that it's exactly where I want it to be, flush against that edge, and then I press, and as you can see, my left hand is holding the tape either higher or lower than the surface. And this will make sure that regardless of how my tape flexes, it will always be straight against that edge. So as I said before, go little by little and make sure that whatever hand you're using to hold the opposite side of the tape is moving up and down to get that straight line. When I have extra tape at the bottom like this, I always try to use as much as possible instead of just wasting it and throwing it away. I always try to figure out some way to use these extra scraps of paper, and in this case, they are the perfect size to use at the bottom of these little edges here to make sure that when I paint those little square boys, that none of my natural wood gets painted. And so I just went ahead and used my scrap pieces for that reason. So when you're taping, try to do your best to find little ways like this to reduce the amount of tape that you end up throwing away and not using and this way it helps you save money on products and tape and it also, you know, helps reduce what you put out there as far as waste goes and it's a, you know, win-win for everybody.
And before I got tape in the drawers, you know I gotta go in here and fix this, so I just went in with a wood carving tool that was part of a kit that I got and made sure to get all of the wood filler so that the whole line looked nice and cohesive and it looked like there was no wood filler ever there. And here we are folks, we are all taped up and ready for painting. I hope that you guys found this video useful and can go forth to your own projects with more confidence and more know-how. And remember that we all start somewhere. I did not know how to use a sander when I first started almost a year ago now, and now I am here. So be patient with yourself, be kind, and keep going. You're on the right path. YouTube is a great, great method to learn new skills, so keep going. And I hope that you guys like and subscribe and do all those things to stay tuned for the next flip. I will be doing a dupe challenge hosted by Clara over at No Can Do. She is an awesome furniture flipper, so make sure to go check her out. And I will be releasing the video for the dupe challenge next week, and then the rest of this flip will be released the week after that. So make sure to stay tuned for that one, and I'll see you next time. In the meantime, stay flippin'.